What's going on, RJ? Chilling, Coach. Uh, I'm excited to see what your team looks like in 2021 because I was doing some research for the show. And one of the things you said was usually takes about three, four years for your program to get where it is headed. You're going into year three. How do you feel about the support around the program, not in the program, around the program over what they've seen since 2018 when you accepted the job? Yeah, it has been so much uh, support um, for the program. You know, obviously we're sitting in a a new facility here that uh, has been six, seven years in the making. And uh, to be able to move in about two weeks in now uh, and just see the the support that our administration, our fans and our financial supporters have put into, you know, the Jones Hill house here has just been tremendous. But then even the local community, you know, I'm from here, I'm a native Washingtonian. And uh, since I've been back, uh, the love has been great. We've been able to reconnect with uh, old friends and uh, you know, the recruiting has been really going well here, especially locally as we continue to, you know, try to develop these relationships and ties to, and this area is very fruitful for recruiting. And we're just trying to develop those relationships needed to land some of these top players from this area. Uh, so I, I can't complain about the support that we've gotten from outside. Talking about the Jones uh, Hill house is like a $150 million project that y'all are very excited about. And you mentioned the local ties and being able to recruit locally. And I've always thought of the MDV as being sort of a sleeping giant, depending on how you want to categorize it. But what does this do in helping you go into those places? Not like, not unlike DeMatha and Gonzaga, but others around the area to bring kids into the University of Maryland. Yeah, as I've said, you know, especially in the DMV area, I think this building signifies a a commitment that's been made that uh, you don't build a facility like Jones Hill House and, uh, not have a commitment to saying, hey, we want to play a major role in college football. Uh, I've been here for 14 seasons over three different uh, three different uh, appearances, meaning, you know, I've coached here, this is my third time back. Mm-hmm. And so I've been able to see, as I like to say, the good, bad, and the ugly. I was here in 01 when we won the ACC championship in Ralph Friesian's first year and saw the success we had for the first three years. We won 10 games and beat teams like Tennessee in the Peach Bowl and uh, played in the BCS game. I was here in the late 90s under Ron Vanderlinden, which kind of built the foundation that we had the success on under Coach Friedgen. And then, you know, to come back under Randy Etzel as a, an assistant, uh, we kind of brought the program, you know, back up a little bit. We had back-to-back uh, years of going to a bowl game, doing the Stefan Diggs era. And, and then now to be able to come back to what I call my dream job uh, as the head coach and put my imprint on Maryland football, uh, can't, can't be more excited about, uh, you know, the opportunity. And, you know, having a facility like Jones Hill House now allows me to go out and not just sell a vision of, of what we want to be, but actually be able to show them um, the tangible uh, the tangible side of having a facility that, in my opinion, having worked at places like Alabama and Florida and Illinois, which are all flagship universities, that this place is second to none of them. And so I'm excited to be able to lead the charge uh, and show that, you know, Maryland is, is ready is ready and serious about football now. You mentioned Stefan Diggs, and we've seen the kind of success that he had had or has had in the NFL. Another guy that I came up watching a lot of Vernon Davis, Dominique Foxworth, a couple of dudes that you have already though, on your team that I'm very excited about that I think can get to that place. Rakeem Jarrett, Dante Demas. I mean, what do those dudes do for you on the out, on the outside, on the numbers? Yeah. You know, the one good thing about the system that we run on offense and it's the system that I implemented there at Alabama and was part of, uh, building. I brought it here, as I like to say. I stole the recipe. Uh, I just need the ingredients. And, and like you said, I feel like we've got some of those ingredients here. Uh, this is a player-centric uh, offensive style. Uh, the receivers typically uh, usually are a big part of it, from Aurelius Ben, DJ Moore, Stefan Diggs, and then, you know, the, the, the quartet of Receivers that I coached and, and was a part of developing there at Alabama and Judy 
Waddle, uh, Devontae Smith, and Henry Ruggs. Uh, this system is is, is receiver friendly. And you know, when you talk about Rakim Jarrett, uh, a guy that has a lot of natural talent, and we saw just glimpses of it last year in our shortened season. But he came in and had a big impact for us as a freshman. And then you talked about Dante Demas, a local product here that has been our most consistent threat during the time I've been here. And you add in guys like Jay Sean Jones and Daryl Jones, you know, we, that room is one of the, the pleasant uh, surprises for me coming in and I think has a chance to be one of the better receiver rooms in the country. I mean, I want to stick with Jerry here for just a second because as an – avid watcher of recruiting he shocked the hell out of me in not picking an sec school and picking maryland and that was no mike Co coach loxley up there what is it that you were telling the kids how are you convincing them other i mean we see the dividends now but he didn't see this he's a part of this what are you telling them well it shocked a lot of people but it didn't shock me because if you know rakim jarrett his DNA is a little different. He's one of those guys that has a lot of confidence in himself. And I've kind of put together kind of a, you know, what I'd like in a player. And not every player has enough uh, intestinal fortitude to make a decision like coming to a place like Maryland instead of going to a, a perennial um, playoff program. Uh, it takes a special kind of guy. And I saw guys like Stefan Diggs make this decision and look at what he's been able to do. I saw Vernon Davis. I recruited Vernon to Maryland. I recruited Sean Merriman to Maryland. And these guys were as heavily recruited as, as, as Rock Kim. And so, as I like to tell people, this isn't my first rodeo with this. And I think it's just a matter of being able to show that others have done this and made this tough decision but like a lot of things in life, man, making the easy decision isn't always the right decision. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you got to take, make a tough decision. And that's where you really, really get paid big off the dividends of uh, buying low and selling, selling high. Another dude you have over there that occupies a large amount of importance because the game is quarterbacks today is Talia Tonga Valoa. And going into this year, it feels like it's his. I understand you brought in another quarterback in Reese Udinsky, but yeah. what is it about him that you were expecting to see in 2021? I think like with any part of our program, including me as a head coach, mm -hmm. just improvement from year to year. We, we talk about getting 1% better each day. And so again, you know, we've had time now to look at what he was able to accomplish last year in a shortened season. And, and I know a lot of people have said he kind of was hot and cold because he had a few games where he threw some interceptions and then he had a bunch of games or a few games where he did some really good things. And so I think consistency typically is the last thing to come when you have a young player. And people have to understand last year, those were the first five starts of his career mm -hmm. as a Division One player. And, uh, and I like to you know say, and I've said this before, if you look at the Indiana game, that's all on me as a head coach and us as coaches. I didn't feel like we gave him a chance to have success in that game. So the one game that I think we can say, hey, you can play better was the Northwestern game. And, and he, I saw him take the necessary steps. You know, after that game, we got back at three in the morning. He was here in the office. I think he just slept in the locker room, came upstairs uh, after that shellacking and immediately went to work on I know what I need to do now. I know I got to put the time in. I, I want to meet with you. I want to meet with Coach Montgomery. I want to spend as much time as I can so that I can go into these games as prepared as I need to be. And, and, and you saw the fruits of the labor for, of that in the Minnesota game, which I think was a signature game for Leah to, to show, hey, this is what I'm capable of doing. And so now the, the you know, the necessary uh, – thing we got to do is get him to play like he did in that game uh, each and every game. Well, you mentioned a number of games in there, but the one that got my attention is the 35 to 19 win against Penn state, especially following the 2019 performance. Did that ring out for you? Um, it was great to see him make the plays, but you know, Rakim Jarrett had a big game, two big explosive catches. Demas had a big game. Uh, Jake Funk, who got drafted by the Rams, had a big game, I thought. And then on the defensive side of the ball, you know, we were starting to really – we had just made the change from going – from.
from playing a lot of zone coverage to playing man coverage. And uh, really, our defense did a great job of uh, executing man coverage schemes and staying with their receivers. And I think it was an overall team effort that, that helped us in that win. And, you know, for us, it was a good win because it's against the – an opponent that has had their way with us a, a lot of years. And again, that's, you know, it was, it was good for us to be able to, uh, to, to get the, have the success against a great program like Penn state. Well, let's, let's talk about the defense side of the ball then, because I'm, I'm looking at who you guys return and you got some hitters on this defensive line in particular, Sam, uh, excuse me, Okuwano and Mo Nasi Lakita. Now I practice. Did I say it right? Yeah, so it's Mosiah Kite. Ah! Kite. Thank you. I appreciate you. That's all right. And I only know because I have to practice those. (laughs) And and Sam O is Sam O. (laughs) He he prefers Sam O. Okay, (laughs) we'll go with Sam O and Mo. What do those do to provide you on the defensive line, Coach? Yeah, two big bodies. Uh, You know, Mo was a junior college prospect that was a – a by, byproduct of he started at the University of Washington and then went JUCO and then came to us uh, and really, really added some size and athleticism in the interior for us. Uh, one of those big body guys that's really twitchy and, uh, you know, Sam O, again, a guy that uh, continues, you know, he's one of those late football guys. He didn't play a lot of football in high school. Uh, went to junior college ranks and, and and you're just starting to see him scratch the surface, which, you know, we're bringing him back for one of those, we call senior super senior years. He's the COVID year allowed him to add another year to his clock. And so he's one of those guys that I think will greatly benefit from it. Both those guys uh, provided a lot of leadership and uh, made a lot of plays for us uh, during the, the shortened season. And I'm really excited to see what those guys look like especially, you know, Mo Kite after, you know, coming to the JUCO ranks, getting here in the summer, this is really his first full year of being in our weight program and spending spring ball and doing all the things that you need to do to improve as a player. So excited to see both those guys uh, this season. Those dudes seem to benefit from the maturation process as much as anybody else, but a dude that I wondered, is he going to be able to help you this year? Is Terrence Lewis. I mean, that was a big get for you in this class. And I wonder just how does he figure for you? Yeah, I mean, you know, T2, as we affectionately call him, uh, is, is one of those guys that, you know, has a lot of talent. Um, obviously, you know, he came in injured, but, uh, you know, we wind up having to have surgery with him uh, within the, the first couple of weeks of him being here, which is, a, again, a byproduct of COVID. You know, we didn't get to go out and see these guys. They didn't come, get to take visits. And, you know, he showed up here after playing a full high school season and, and has a torn ACL. And he played all as, as pretty much all year, I think, uh, with it because he said it was bothering him. And so we checked it out and he, he had a torn ACL. So we're, we're glad that we were able to get the surgery done. We're hopeful we'll be able to get him back in time, you know, somewhere in the middle of the season. Uh, if 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 he's able to, but to get a guy of his ability uh, out of Miami, um, could have went anywhere in the country. Again, he kind of fits that criteria I told you that I'm looking for. Uh, there's only a certain kind of kid that can make the decision to turn down Florida, Georgia, Alabama, you know, those types of programs to come to Maryland before Maryland has made a mark in college college football but they have to have them be made up of the right stuff. They've got to be really confident players. They got to be guys that are self starters that feel like, Hey, I have enough confidence in my ability that I can go have an impact on a program and not just be another guy that came through a great program. And so, as I say all the time, not a lot of guys are built for those type of decisions. And when we find guys that are, we we're, we're all over them and, you know, Brian Williams and our defensive staff did a great job of setting the table for us to get them. Now, Coach, I want to talk about your backfield because you mentioned Jake Funk got drafted by the Rams. I think he averaged something like 8.6 yards per carry, over 500 yards. But it ain't like you don't have dudes back there. And in particular, one that I know of uh, and very familiar with and Isaiah Jacobs. And I want to ask, how do you figure for you? But I also want to touch on Josh Jacobs as well. Couple dudes from my backyard, couple dudes from Tulsa. 
Right. What is it about those two players in particular that you liked? Uh, anybody that knows that family knows their story and, and the perseverance that they both have. I mean, you know, the story has been well told of spending nights sleeping in, in the car, uh, you know, living with their dad, you know, from homeless shelter to homeless shelter and just to meet these boys and, and see just how, great of people they are, man. And my hat goes off to, to, to dad, man. He did a great job with these boys with, you know, the little he had. And, you know, they both have that chip on their shoulder. Um, if you ever meet them and if you know them, you know, they're very private people that they don't have big circles. They don't talk a lot, but they are tough. They are reliable. Uh, they play hard. Um, they're physical. And as I like to say, they both kind of run angry like they're mad. And, and they probably are a little bit mad. Some of the things they had to go through uh, growing up there in, in Tulsa. Well, hey, look, uh, I see Marty every now and again when I go get my lineup and, you know, he mentioned that I was going to talk to you. He said, hey, you be nice to Mike. We like Mike. And I'm like, hey, look, I didn't, I didn't even say nothing. So I mean, you made an imprint for them. And I appreciate that because, as I said, they're close – to me, close to my heart, coming out of this place, and I wish them well. Uh, Coach, I want to make a take it to a bigger picture here because it. one of the things I look at all the time is these divisions, and we could talk about how they stack up or how they don't stack up, but it occurs to me that you play in one of the deepest divisions in all of college football, and you're talking about getting 1% better. You ain't got no choice is, is how I feel about it when you look at how guys have been recruiting around you and how those teams have been building toward playing really competitive football themselves. Do you think that this is the deepest division in college football? You know, I haven't spent time in the ACC, uh, spent time obviously in the SEC West at Alabama. I was in the SEC East at Florida. Um, it's a tough, tough division. There's no doubt about it. And, uh, you know, I'm going to get on my soapbox for a minute because with this playoff uh, expansion talk, uh, to me, the Big Ten can position ourselves because I feel like we are the, the strongest conference from top to bottom to, to maybe have to shake this thing up a little bit to, you know, maybe rethink how we're, we're split and aligned to where we, you know, move some pieces around to put us in the best possible position as a conference uh, to get multiple teams in this playoffs. As we all know, that's that's the way you get the payday for the league is uh, multiple teams in the playoffs. And if we're going to go to 12, you know, to have three teams like Michigan, Penn State, uh, and Ohio State all in one division where they typically knock each other off, I, I just think, you know, it's something that as we look to improve and get 1% better as a football program here, that it's, maybe it's time for us as a conference to, to look at those things and say, hey, is this the best situation uh, to put us in the best light to be a part of the playoff uh, picture with multiple teams, uh, the way we're aligned. So uh, I would say that there's no doubt the Big Ten East is a very, very tough division, as is the West. Again, I, I'm not saying that, that the West side doesn't have the talent because I do believe top to bottom this league is as good as any league in the country. But as you look to see – the college playoff expansion, you know, the first thing that comes to my mind is what gives us the best chance of, and to just position ourselves as a league to, to get the multiple teams in there because that's that's what creates the, the conference uh, notoriety. That's how you build your brand. In relation to the college football playoff and what we think of is inevitable expansion. I'm for 16 teams. We'll start with 12 and I, I'm okay with that. But to that ask and I ask you do you agree that the playoffs should expand do you like the current system do you want it to revert how do you feel about it so I think it's time to expand mm -hmm. um you know and, and obviously 16 is more, would be more ideal but I do understand that you have to maybe work up to that point um I think 12 again offers the opportunities uh to allow our you know the non-power five uh, schools opportunities in that they haven't necessarily always gotten. Um, but then, and I think it also allows 
uh, the flexibility and, and the having different teams. I mean, if you look at the research that they showed, you know, you, you know, four teams have been in this playoffs, you know, 60, 70 percent of the playoffs. So I do think it uh, affords a little more uh, a little more excitement about the playoffs, because, as you know, in the playoffs, it's one game and you got to play your best and anything can happen, as we see in basketball. Uh, that it could be that one game. So uh, I'm for the expansion, whether it's 12 or 16, um, you know, preferably 16, but 12 is a good starting point. Hey Amen. They got 16 in the NBA. They got 14 in the NFL. They got 16 yeah. next year in the NHL. 16 is a good number. I think it's a, a, the right number. But more to that, like, I want to see the kids decide who wins the national championship, not a bunch of people in a boardroom telling me what they think because I, I don't trust human beings to pick the best teams. But on to the other big issue, I think, in college football right now, which is the advent of name, image, and likeness. And in one shape or another, I've given this question to all the coaches who are gracious enough to join us here. I'm giving it to you. How do you feel about name, image, and likeness? Does it make you at all anxious? Are you all full speed ahead? How do you feel about it? I'm full speed ahead. I'm both feet in. I think it's uh, long overdue. Um, having been a witness of, you know, growing up here in the DMV, as we call it, um, and an avid, you know, Georgetown Hoya fan growing up, even though I did love my Terps too, uh, I saw Patrick Ewan take Georgetown from McDonough Arena, which I think at best holds 3,500, and that's at best, mm -hmm. to selling out the what was then known as the Capital Center, where they had 18,000 fans uh, to see Georgetown, and a lot of it was because they wanted to see Patrick Ewing. And so, to me, uh, it's long overdue. Uh, I am anxious because, you know, it's just so gray and murky right now, and there's not been a lot of uh, direction given from the powers that be that are, that are handling it. And, you know, I think if you leave it up to the states to manage, each state is going to have their own – uh, kind of idea of what it should look like. And that in turn creates competitive advantages or disadvantages for others uh, that I don't think makes it fair. So I'm all for it, but I want it to be looked at and put into a position to where it's fair and, and it doesn't create competitive advantages for anyone, but the players and I, the players deserve to be able to make money off of their name, image, and likeness. I'm all for it, a proponent of it, but we do need to, find a way to shape it uh, so that it doesn't create the wild, wild west uh, in recruiting, but also kind of have boundaries to it that allows us to understand uh, what we're allowed to do and not to do. You mentioned Georgetown. And one of the things that I always tell people about Georgetown is I, I'm, I'm born in 1987, right? So I'm a puppy. I turn 34 next month. But the reason I put it that way is because I thought Georgetown was an HBCU, okay? Like, when I saw Coach Thompson over there with the towel and Patrick Ewan doing what he was doing on the tape, but then Allen Iverson is my age, right? Like, that's yeah. he coming through when I'm watching the sport. I'm going, what, what, what do you mean Georgetown ain't yeah. no HBCU? And then, you know, to look at what you are doing at Maryland and you have Howard on the schedule, I'm looking at your non-conference that, again, I would want to hear what you think about playing at school like Howard, but also yeah. that West Virginia game, feels like a really good test for you all and a really good place for you to say, hey, look, uh, we're going to challenge somebody for a title this year. Yeah, you know, to start off with a team, a game like West Virginia is a great test for us because, again, last year with playing five games, we never really got a feel for necessarily who we were. I felt like we were a team that improved, but – we just didn't have enough body of work to say, yeah, we did, or yeah, no, we didn't. Uh, I felt as though we did. Um, you know, playing West Virginia and the opener, to me, like right from the bat, right from the get-go, we find out kind of where we are because that's a, a good opponent. It's a, a regional rivalry for us. Uh, I've been here over the years with that game, and it, it, they usually have been really good battles. So um, I'm excited for our team to – to have an opportunity to test ourselves and, and see exactly how far our program has come against a, a formidable regional rival like West Virginia. 
Um, and then playing Howard, um, Larry Scott's one of my great friends uh, in the business. Um, I, I personally hate playing because I don't like playing my friends. Mm. But I do think, you know, giving them an opportunity to come over, you know, short drive, um, play play us here. And, and, and you know, it's the game is on 9-11. So the anniversary of 9-11 in this area was affected uh, by 9-11 with the, you know, attack on the Pentagon there. Uh, it'd be a great opportunity, you know, just to, you know, it'll be almost like the world's largest go-go, you know, that's the, the music that's in this area. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. You got, the, you got the outdoor cocktail party, which I know they don't like calling it that between Florida and Georgia, but maybe we'll call the the Howard Maryland game, the, the world's largest go-go and get some of our native uh, go-go bands to come play and just have a great time and go out and compete. See, now, now you're trying to get me to come out to the game because they, you <laughs> tell me you got Maryland Howard playing a football game, and then I get to see all of D.C. come out. Yeah, now I'm going to be there. You, then you're going to put, put go-go music in front of me? Yeah, all right. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to be through there. Uh, the, one of the last things I wanted to ask you about, coaches, and we touched on it throughout this, uh, this interview, is the emphasis that you have put on recruiting and how successful you have been with it in a very short amount of time. But that is also – just part of your persona as a coach. Everywhere you have been, you have been a capable recruiter. And I understand you got the criteria and I understand there are kids that have to meet that criteria. But what is it about you that makes you want to do that kind of work? Because it's not easy to do. No, it's not, but it's the lifeline of, of, of any program. Hmm. Um, they, they say if recruiting is like shaving. If you don't do it every day, you look like a bum. And so... Uh, <laughs> And so uh, I, I recruit because as great a coach as I am, I was a much better coach with Devontae Smith and Henry Ruggs and Jerry <laughs> Judy and Calvin Ridley and Jalen Waddle uh, in, in, on the field for me. Um, and so and I've also been a, a terrible coach when I didn't have those type of players and, and didn't win a lot of games. So it's the lifeline of what we do. Um, I'm a big believer that if people like you, they're going to buy from you. And I hope I come across as uh, over the years as being honest, transparent. Um, obviously, I have uh, a lot of validation. I call it third party validation from great players to say, when I played for Locks, he did these things. He did the things he said he would do. I, I earned degrees. I had opportunity to be developed to go to the next level. Uh, and now it's just time to have success on the field as a head coach and hopefully uh, allow others like myself to get that chance to be a coaches. Now, coach, I'm, I'm here for it. Um, you have my whole heart and I wish you great uh -huh. success going into this 2021 season. I'm going to be watching as much as I possibly can, especially in this conference. You know what it is. Thank you so much for joining us here on the number one ranked show coach. We hope to have you back during the season. Appreciate you, RJ. 